opportunity for public comment, followed by items by consensus. <coughs> Dr. McLeod, do we have any um, recognitions to this meeting? I have one recognition. I would like to recognize Madeline Francis. Um, Madeline <coughs> has um, been selected as a candidate for the United States Presidential Scholars Program. Um, annually, this program, Scholars Program, program recognizes and honors some of our nation's most distinguished graduating student, uh, seniors. And annually, up to 161 students are chosen from among outstanding graduating seniors to become U.S. Presidential Scholars, one of the nation's highest honors for high school students. So I wanted to congratulate her. I think that's a wonderful accomplishment. Absolutely. And now we have an opportunity for public comment. And no one here public. Do, do you want to do public comment? Yes. Okay. Welcome. Hello. Please come join us up at the table. And this is Chuck Joseph, who sits on the board of the Hopkins Center for the Arts. And we wanted to just take a few minutes uh, today to talk to you about some concerns that were raised um, by our recent application for the for an on-premises liquor license at the Hopkins Center for the Arts. Um, we did meet with Superintendent McLeod earlier this week uh, to talk about some safety concerns, and we share her concerns and look forward to working toward a solution for them. Uh, we also, first and foremost, wanted to address the hours that were listed on the application. That seems to be um, a large bit of concern. And to clarify that we will not be serving alcohol dur during those hours, only at events that take place during those hours. Um, so we just wanted to be very clear about that. We'll be speaking to the selectmen about that um, this week to change the wording on the application to reflect that. Um, we also uh, wanted to make sure that uh, the community knew and certainly the school knew that we are going to abide by all the safety requirements that are required with this license, working with the police, working with the schools, and abiding by all of those requirements to uh, hold this license. Um, we also, first and foremost, want to make it very clear that the Hopkinton students and all of the students in surrounding communities are um, of the foremost in our mind in all of the decisions that we make over at the Hopkins Center for the Arts. We've begun just this year, as we opened our new building, several programs, including hosting the Be Free Coffee Houses, after school programs, and we want to continue to develop those relationships and offer those opportunities. And that is our focus. This is a secondary, um, even <laughs> less than a secondary focus of what we'll be providing at the Hopkins Center for the Arts, but we think it will be a strong uh, component in order to encourage the community to attend arts events at the Hopkins Center for the Arts rather than possibly traveling to Boston or to Providence, and also will allow us to host private events on a very limited basis. Um, we want to be able to host private events at uh, the center, and we have learned from our cohorts are, are uh, people that we uh, share a kindred spirit with at uh, TCAN and Natick, if you're familiar with them, and have learned from them how significant uh, a revenue generator this can be. And as an arts organization, the one thing we have certainly learned in the last couple of years is that programming alone will not sustain us. We do need to find alternative resources in order to sustain all of the things that we want to do uh, in the community. And so um, as part of our business plan and as part of being able to be uh, good stewards of all that we, we are doing. This is just a small part of it. So we uh, welcome any questions, any concerns. We want to be uh, good neighbors. We want to be um, able to grow our organization and continue to support all the programs that we're doing there. Any other? Uh, this is the on? best board appearance I've ever had. <laughs> this is great. You, you, you've covered them all. Yeah, and we do, we do apologize. We do have to leave because we have a board meeting in about a half an hour, so we can't stay um, for Otherwise the rest of the meeting. Otherwise, we'd be here for the, for the discussion. We, we would stay, but, but please um, call on us anytime. We're available for any questions or concerns that you have. So I don't know if you're not going to be here for the presentation, if the committee has questions that you guys want to ask now. I know I have, I have a question, but I'll, 
Yeah, if we could do that during, I mean, we don't normally do that in public comment just for other people who are watching, but. Um, but I think that would be, I would really appreciate the opportunity if that's okay. But I don't have to go first. Um, <coughs> the question I have, so you talk about how this isn't a liquor license for those hours, but more for events. So how or why is this, why is what you're seeking different than I presume what you saw when you had your, like the opening night? So that's like an Sorry. event liquor sure. license. So why are we doing it? Why we? Why are you doing it this way <laughs> as opposed to that way per event? It's, it's a fair question. <clears throat> what we tried to do in the hours was to bracket the times that an event could occur so that we had the ability to, um, to serve alcohol during those periods but only for the two or three hour period of an event. And if we, if you think about it, if we have to go every time there's an event up there for one day liquor license, we've learned from TCAN, they, they did that for like five years and they said it was crazy because it's just, it's needless if we have the permission to do this and we're working under a single license, then we can just do our planning accordingly. It, it, it's no, no difference really. I mean, you could, you could go for just one after another day license, but I'm not sure what you gain by doing that. So I guess, to me, I mean, and I don't know if it's really about the liquor license and more just about the, the use of the space and whether or not there are events happening at the school. Um, how are those gonna be planned? And maybe this really rolls into like a parking lot discussion, which I think is sort of what a lot of this brought up for me is the parking lot issue. And so if there are school events um, happening in the, on an evening where someone wants to have a private, I don't, I don't even know, engagement dinner, I, who mm -hmm. knows, right? They right. wanna do something like that. How is, and if it, is the school going to be considered, are events at the school going to be considered, how are you guys planning or allowing for events like that where presumably liquor will be served? This came up with our discussion with Superintendent McLeod. Um, the cross-parking agreement that we have with the schools, the schools have priority. We have to clear our calendar with them. So there'll be a single point of contact here. You know, do you have parents' night that night? Then we can't do anything on parents' night. But, if, but we, we're gonna clear a theatrical performance, a musical performance, and say these are the dates we have. Are you okay with it? And basically, you guys run the show and we kind of follow. Mm -hmm. Which is what we've been doing already. Yeah. Um, we, we have, because your, you, you're wonderful about sending it a year ahead, we know exactly when all of your events are and we plan out around them. Yeah. I had a question about hours also. What about when there are things <coughs> happening in your building, like painting classes or acting classes because there's some Saturday time when I'm guessing you have so any time that there would be people mm -hmm. kids in your building when these events are going on right well the these events are going to be happening in the, the buildings almost I don't know if you've been there it's almost like two separate areas so there's one area that's uh, the performance center where the main events would be happening and there's a the, the, the barn school. we call it is the school where the, all the classes are happening they really are separate and that's what I meant by following the safety guidelines that the ABBC spells out and what you need as far as tip certified bartenders and security and uh, and staff and we will abide by all of those safety regulations regardless of time of day okay. when that is happening okay. I think one of the about locking away everything yes. locked down yes. that's it's required it's mm -hmm. in a secure place it's not it's never not out in the open mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. just building on the the and again risking making this more conversation about the parking agreement than the actual application but but the hours also made me realize that and I understand the calendar sharing but one thing I noted about the hours on it was that they start at five o'clock mm -hmm. and the it's not necessarily event based that we're gonna have that problem with the schools because at five o'clock, the parking lots are still actively in use. Mm -hmm. So was there consideration given to those hours in that? <laughs> I can't imagine a situation where five o'clock is a good time to have people coming over. No. For that exactly. Anyway. And is it so, exactly. But on the application, it starts then. That was right, what gave right. me pause. And that's what we understand the confusion. That, okay. that simply was, um, those are standard hours that are listed as available okay. to do that. The, the okay. likelihood of that ever happening, I, I couldn't imagine. Okay, um, that's so. helpful. Thank you. Um, so it's helpful to have you here. Thank you because I think uh, I think we're all trying to be careful about what is in our purview just because we're abutters essentially versus not really understanding the protocol uh, and requirements of liquor licensing and 
understanding that that's not really our job, but, um, mm -hmm. you know, but so because our students are involved, um, you know, just wanting to make sure that we've asked all the right questions and been thoughtful about it. And so most of the questions that I have centered around the hours, and it sounds like that clarification is that those are basically event hours, mm -hmm. but not necessarily, but then individual to each event is the decision about whether you will or will not be serving alcohol. Um, and so I guess I, I think somebody started to ask this question too would would there be a situation where you would have an event happening um, in the hayloft area and classes going on downstairs at the same time um, that's it's possible um, I would say unlikely okay. because just of the nature of the events that would be serving alcohol there could be you know several events happening during those times but not during the day and yeah. not and you know often um, any event that's going any class um, is going to end by seven eight o'clock but not on a Friday Saturday okay. yeah. Yeah. these are happening on Friday Saturday evenings there's no classes happening during that no time. I was more thinking like somebody rents it for a bridal shower on a Saturday right. afternoon and you also have right. ballet right. or whatever you right. have right. of the many many things that you have um, and so I think it's helpful too to understand at least for me so basically you're holding the license and then anyone wanting to serve alcohol you have guidelines that are posed on you about how they go through that process and they have to have the tip certified whatever right. person and exactly. all of that is really regulated and not our job to That's regulate correct. you in that regard okay I, I think it's just important I mean I know I, I know both of you obviously <laughs> personally and you guys I, I know really put the interest of our kids you've you've developed a great relationship with the schools and I know that you have the interest of their kids at, at heart but you have to take a step back and just make sure absent personalities does sure. this fit um, you know because we're such a close of butter does this fit what we're comfortable with from a school perspective so um, you know I know you're probably getting a lot of questions in the community as well but I think those were my main considerations just keeping the events separate from the kids and then also about locking up the, yes. the alcohol that so it will be. be stored on premises but it will be locked exactly. Exactly. okay yep. and and really to be clear our goal and mission is as an art center and so the lion's share of what we're going to be offering at the art center are arts related <laughs> events not and classes and um, not private events this is just a very small portion of what we do mm -hmm. So I, I just have a, two more questions. Um, um, one is with respect to outdoor, or, or is any alcohol going to be permitted outside? That's a good question. Um, we are um, looking into the parameters of what that means. Um, for example, if there is a wedding on a Friday or Saturday evening, um, we have to be aware that uh, it's in the middle of the summer um, if people wander outside. We may need to have... Um, that listed as that outdoor area within our liquor license and that would be the reason behind it um, there it, there won't be a situation you know sir, again during school hours or during school events where there's going to be um, an event serving liquor outside but yes that will be included for those reasons because I don't know again I don't know if you've been over to the to the center before but the Performing Arts Center has a beautiful farmers porch in the front and a patio area in the back that was intended to actually be used as a stage to play music so it is quite possible that weddings could happen on uh, that area um, and so it will be limited um, it to that property in that area so I mean, I'll, I'll just say out loud that that causes me some some concern because even th so, you're sitting here and you're you're the director and and mm -hmm. checks on the board, but stuff like that will change. And once the license um, or the permit is granted, okay. um, who knows how the next director is going to feel? Sure. Um, so it causes me concern for that reason. And then also, I mean, I I think that just going to I think I'll use Quattro as an example and they originally had the outdoor seating and you couldn't they had to stand there at the door and say you can't take alcohol outside I mean go ahead and go outside and be refreshed or whatever but you can't take alcohol right. out there if I could speak to that because yep. I, uh, I don't think we've determined yet whether the patio can be used because the the rules and regulations do require it to be enclosed if okay. you're serving alcohol okay. so I'm not sure that's even going to be applicable to the art center we may not be able to use that Okay, and that's something that's decided by who? Is that that's the, those are the ABCs. ABCs. Okay. Yeah. 
Um, and then the, the other question, this is just maybe more general because you're here and we have a request, I think, for a letter, is what, what are you looking for from us and what do you see our role here? We, we see ourselves in, in collaboration with the schools. <coughs> I mean, we, we haven't even, this is our first year of operation, so we're not even, we're just trying to start <laughs> to crawl right now, you know, but in two or three years we're going to be running, and hopefully we're going to be running in a really coordinated, unified way with the schools from the arts perspective and in, integrating with their curriculum and supplementing what may not be able to happen during the school day here. We, th we think that's some real exciting possibilities in there. So what we're looking for is that you understand that this is an ancillary um, part of our plan. It's part of our business plan as our X number of weddings or private functions because art centers fail. And they fail financially because they can't support themselves with classes. So we would appreciate a letter that supports the mission of the HCA, understands that this is a small piece of the puzzle, but recognizing that we're taking all the necessary safety precautions to make sure that there's no difficulty with the students and we're coordinating with your time frames and not overlapping. So our letter would look something like, you know, we, we've had we, whatever we've we talked to the HCA about our concerns this is we agree that their mission is to support the arts in collaboration with the schools you know presently based on not, uh, not detrimental to the educational activities yeah. of the school MGL okay chapter well, 130 oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's it in a nutshell <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah okay yeah. and we appreciate that we, we, we genuinely really appreciate that and um, you know all kidding aside that this coordination is, is one of the real exciting possibilities of having that facility in proximity to these three schools that are here. Mm -hmm. Can I ask one more question? Yeah. <laughs> um, how often, so when, assuming you got the liquor license, is it good for a certain period of time? <coughs> or it gets reviewed? Or this know. is like a lifetime? I, I don't know. That's I, a good I, question. Yeah. I, I'm sure there is a. a I mean, I'm term sure if there's a violation, then certain yeah. other things kick That's into right. place. But I'm just wondering, you know, to the point about, particularly about the outside patio question mm -hmm. um, you know if it's reviewed in three years it may well be that you have enclosed that space in that period of time and that would be something that you would be changing and I'm sure we would get another letter but that's right. um, I just didn't know if you knew off the top of your head yeah, what that, that that's like yes. no that's a good question and um, Ralph mr. Dumas has a question if I could I have some experience with uh, running function halls in other communities and the um, question I have is, it, will the town require you to have a police detail uh, when you hold functions? We're, we're meeting with the police on that this week. Mm -hmm. um, much like you have functions here, if you have a large turnout at an athletic event, you don't always have to have one. Sometimes it's anticipatory if you think it's going to be a big event. If we have a theatrical performance or a music performance over there, we're probably in the 250 range. You know, mm -hmm. We've got 45 parking spaces on our site. Anyway. So we've got to find out what the police wants. Uh, if the police tell us, you know, you, if you think you're going to hit 300, we want a detail, then that's what we do. I was actually thinking about a police detail inside the building. Uh, for example, if you have a wedding of 250 or 300 yeah. people. One, one of the roles of a police detail at a function is to keep an eye on uh, alcohol consumption. Right. I, I don't know that answer, Ralph. I don't know. But your tips certified. Exactly. That, yes. That's the requirement of keeping the, an eye that's on. That's correct. Exactly. And that, that's and the primary. It's all spelled out in, in the, the requirements of the licensee. Mm -hmm. And there's a, a certain ratio, you know, per, for tip certified bartenders and wait staff per uh, customer. Patrons. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. All right. Thank, Thank you, you all, Thank all so much. Appreciate it. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. Okay. Is there anyone else here for public comment? Okay. And then. Yep. Yeah, this this is the time. If there's anyone here to talk about the school lunch program, this is your opportunity to speak to the school lunch program. I don't know if that's why you guys are here, if you just want to hear it. If you want to speak to the school lunch program, this would be your opportunity. No? Nope. Nope. Okay. okay. Um, so we'll go to school committee reports, reports to the school committee. There's no one here from student council. Um, liaison reports. Um, I'll just briefly say the, um, and we'll have another <coughs> meeting before this, but Chris Heron is coming to speak <coughs> to, oh, all right. Go so ahead, you're you do it. it. No, you do it. No, you got the flyer, it's so fine. you'll remember all the details. All right. But I just, on behalf of the 
um, coalition. I wanted to point that out and also just let you know that the Charter Review Committee is meeting regularly and uh, we're slowly plotting our way through the current charter and recommendations that were given to us sort of at the beginning of the meeting, I mean of the process and then we'll get to the point of scheduling public hearings and there also will be, um, we will be reaching out to all the committees in town so you'll be getting contacted from someone on that committee to weigh in. Okay, any other liaison reports? And if you guys don't have anything to report, we're <laughs> there was oh, discussion That's about right, the basement meeting. Um, yeah, we just had continued discussion. We're continuing with the design. I forgot that was after the last meeting. So yes, we did meet. We're continuing with the design development. We're continuing to look at the interior spaces in the building and just sort of supplement the tremendous amount of work that's being done by the working groups, um, which are really the, the people who are going to be using the building. So um, continued progress. Um, we did hire the, a construction manager and their name is completely Call Antonio Construction from Holliston. Call Antonio Construction from Holliston. So we hired a construction manager. They attended our last meeting, um, you know, and seem, I think the, the biggest question that was posed to them was um, the timeline and the budget. Does it look realistic? And they felt very, very comfortable with both the timeline and the budget that was proposed. Um, so we continue on track for that fall of 2018. So Mr. I could say this. Last week I drove past there uh, late in the day and there were five or six uh, vehicles there uh, and there were a bunch of guys who were getting ready to take a walk in. So uh, that was pretty exciting. Yeah, well, that's who they were. Uh, so, you know, that's an, an exciting, uh, you know, uh, sign, I think, that, you know, maybe sooner rather than later things are going to start. I think we're still targeting early yep. site packages yep. in the summer, so. I think it was last Friday I drove by and there was an Eversource car yep. at that entrance. That's right. Yeah. Yep. So they're moving. So in response to the ESBC meeting, I know that there was some um, there was some discussion about the finishes and the interior finishes. And um, Mr. Mosier had uh, contacted me following the meeting to ask if there could be further discussion about opportunities to really personalize and, and make this space really exciting. So we did have a follow-up meeting uh, this week. And uh, the woman who we've been working with came back and we, we started to really brainstorm a theme. Um, it all starts here. And we were excited about the, the thought of it all starts here because this is also the beginning of school and we could have a start line as they enter off the buses. So we started to really have some exciting discussion around and they shared with us, the architects shared with us, some other buildings that they've done where there was a local artists that were involved in creating these wonderful murals. Um, so we are going to follow up um, with further discussion. If there are any local artists out there who would like to volunteer their time to the committee, um, we would love to have your input. And, um, and it's, it's, it's exciting to think about some of the possibilities, obviously, within the budget that we could, that we could do to make this just, just really specific to, to our community. I think the, the finishes discussion was interesting for me too because as you said within the budget they they've they show a lot of things that can be done that make it look not like a typical elementary school that we're used to in terms of floor designs and yeah. characteristics and textures that you can give to walls and you start to get really really excited which is great yeah but I we, we saw at the ESBC meeting let, let the last ESBC meeting there's a point when it goes too far yeah right this is right. a building that has to last us for a really long That's time right. so I love those the, the thematic ideas yeah. but there were some things thrown around about making things really really bright and primary yeah. colors and oh no that's going to look really good on the first day. <laughs> yeah. So We actually so want the opposite of primary colors agreed. because we want the children's artwork to stand out right. against them. So there's right. been a lot of this kind of conversation. But yes. but it's it's very exciting times. And, um, yeah, just really basic, like we've been talking about having shapes in the in the preschool mm -hmm. room as, as markers wow. instead of just squares. And then letters. Um, in kindergarten and numbers in first grade, you know, it, as, in, in the, just using them in all different kinds of fonts. And so very, very uh, thank you to, e to the ESBC for, um, for their feedback to the, to the design group. Um, oh, next is the school committee report. You'll see on the agenda that we are, do we, did we put it, we didn't put it in the, um, 
the lease agreement with the BAA and the 26.2 foundation? It wasn't in the packet? It, it's, it is. It is in the packet? Okay. Yeah. yeah. E. Um, e. So, here. <coughs> no, I knew it was on the agenda. I just didn't, no. I don't remember. Yep, okay. I do remember seeing it. Okay. Um, so we had a meeting with the folks from the BAA and the 26.2 Foundation, <coughs> and we reached agreement, <coughs> basically extending um, no. what already what the agreement has been in the past um, with respect to funding and parking lot use and other facilities use. Uh, the only I think change was there were two changes that are of substance. One is the s renewal provision, which um, we ended up saying you know to the if it's not renegotiated it will automatically renew for that next year and then the other change was to um, they wanted to be able to meet with dr. McLeod they wanted a certain where the, the dates we ended up saying that we were not going to be specific on dates that we would have a conversation once you mean the new building um, minimum access at okay. least five days prior to the date of the event so, the so date, that's the change that's, that's correct they didn't put, we didn't put a specific date in here but at least five days prior to the marathon they will have some access so they were saying like normally they come in on friday but let's say the weather's gonna be bad maybe they want to come in on wednesday so we added um that without specificity to the contract without specificity and then i have since followed up with the organizers <coughs> to talk about we as we had our discussion, we agreed to Wednesday night they could come and do the mar markings on the field um, because that wouldn't require any equipment, and then they could begin after 3 p.m. on Thursday to set up, mm -hmm. and that we would restrict our fields on Friday so that we would not have any students out using the fields in any capacity for sports, for PE, for the Friday so that they could have that day. Um, and that gave them some flexibility around weather as well as final inspections. Um, so it was a good meeting. And then the only other thing to report is on communications. We had, I think I went to the entire committee, the, um, I don't know, thanks for the Business Professionals of America group at the high school. We've also received some communications with respect to sexual education. One was a policy question with respect to, well, I'm not sure if it was policy, but it related to the modified curriculum available for special learners, which um, Dr. McLeod will address and the other was more specific to Hopkins and the title in the books that were being used there and so that was being addressed directly by Mr. Kernan and then the other communication that we've received is with respect to mm -hmm. minutes um, and Dr. Dr. McLeod and I and John um, have followed up and will be responding to the request for particular minutes. So next we have the superintendent's report. Yeah, I have a few, few great things. Um, <laughs> first is uh, just talk very briefly about, I, I'm understanding today that first ever two hour delay um, that was, that we had this morning um, over the Elmwood power outage. I was notified at six o'clock this morning. Um, and of course we haven't had this for only a couple of our schools, so we didn't have a robocall. And uh, I've had people come to me and say, you always sound so cheery at six, mm -hmm. six four, five o'clock in the morning. And I'm like, yeah, those are taped in the summer. Um, <laughs> this one was not. So it was a bit more challenging because we didn't have it all pre-taped. And we also, um, Linda Henderson and Al Rogers had to help me out remotely. They weren't, they didn't have access. So we, we believe that some of the glitches on communication with some people that didn't get the call was because of that. Um, we tried in multiple ways to contact people. We made sure that we contacted, for example, the YMCA, um, who would have previously had daycare there. Um, there was supposed to be a PD day taking place, so we had to call the provider around that. Um, and But it was everybody worked together. We made sure that there was somebody at the door. There were, I would say, three or four families who showed up with children at the Elmwood School and two at the Center School. Um, but we did try, you know, again, multiple ways. So I just want to thank everybody for helping to to be as efficient as we could in in a very un unexpected um, weather incident. Um, and we 
we did we were successful we had decided determined that we could stick with the two-hour delay knowing that we had been informed that we were going to be getting power back we got power back before within the two-hour window and we were all over there celebrating and I would say the kids had been in for maybe an hour when there was a, again an, another small outage um, when some kids were exiting to go out to recess um, and some children were on a stairway so again we will debrief next week we always learn from these events one thing that we learned was that there was a some some lights that were missing on that staircase and and also that we need to make sure that we have flashlights that have working batteries and we always learn we always debrief and we always improve so I'm chuckling at the flashlights because it's like it being in your house when the power right, goes out right? and you realize that none of your flashlights have working. batteries right. <laughs> right right oh yeah they all have batteries but they're dead um i had a wonderful, wonderful uh, visit at the Hopkins Curriculum Expo on Tuesday night. I know that, Ellen, I saw you there. Um, they always try to do something different, but the... I'll spoil it for those of us who haven't gone to ours yet. I will not spoil it. It's not that secret, but just the way that they interacted and gave opportunities for students and, and parents to explore together with the child leading the way. It was, it was really wonderful, just really a lot of very enthusiastic, focused, you know, every classroom that I walked into, people, you know, were just so involved doing things with their students and in a way that teachers have prepped kids to be able to be the person that was leading their parent through. Um, so just, just really lovely and, and thank you to the teachers for providing such a wonderful opportunity for parents. Um, and of course to the administrators who are there for all three of those nights. Um, Chris Heron will be here uh, March the 17th, 7 o'clock till 8.30 at the Hopkinton Middle School Auditorium. Um, he, he, the, his presentation is Rebound, the Chris Heron story, um, who, who really tells a, a story about alcohol and, and, and um, drug addiction. And apparently it is a very compelling and strong message he will be visiting student not visiting doing a presentation in the middle school during the day and then there's an evening performance <laughs> we have reached out to surrounding communities Ashland and Holliston um, to also invite parents from those communities to be part of the presentation um, and then I, I heard that Holliston had had in he, there recently he, yeah um, but it was standing room only so I'm sure they'll be so overflowed. they we have so we've reached out inviting people yeah <laughs> <laughs> that's why we well, that's moved why they did it in the middle that's why we moved to the middle yeah, school exactly. we have capacity for 750 there mr. Dumas uh, I don't know. okay um, I also wanted to announce that I am going to be, thank you HCAM, I am going to be hosting my own show. Ooh. <laughs> and I won't pretend that I made up the, the name because I didn't, but Highlights from the Hill is something that we've been talking about for a while. Um, and it's going to air monthly beginning on March the 22nd, one o'clock. Um, and I will be able to have special guests attending. I'm very excited. I feel like this kind of replaces um, the, the what we had last year with the re recognitions prior to school committee but in a way that I can keep people abreast of exciting things and, and all, also you know give reports on things that are happening but I've never had my own television show <laughs> so I'm very excited about it and thank you for the opportunity I think it'll it'll be a great way for me to be also be able to bring a variety of of you know highlight people that all the great people that work in this community so um, and then finally I want to highlight um, something else that you know is near and dear to my heart we will be having another all-star reading series for parents um, beginning March the 16th um, and thank you to the um, the HPTA for always for helping me to organize this and offer babysitting um, it's a three-part series you can come to one or all of them bring your kids uh, we'll have babysitting and um, and Carver has has agreed to, to join Lauren DeBow and myself in, in the presentation this year. So um, we are looking forward to that and are thankful for being invited to do it again. Apparently, um, the parents at the at the forum that we had, the State of the Schools, mm -hmm. um, they were the ones that brought it up and said, hey, it would be great if you would do that again. So um, we will be doing it. And that's it. Can I ask you a question on the Chris Herring? What age, appro it's going to be in the middle school during the day. Mm -hmm. Is that the age? I think so. Than, than I think so. Way. He definitely has a website, so you could go on there and look. Okay. okay, next we have the Whitson's annual financial projection report. So I'd like to invite Mr. Welch and Armenti up. Just for background uh, for the committee, uh, 
currently in year one of a uh, set of three one-year contracts with Whitson's. This is the second contract we've had with them, so overall this is Whitson's fourth year with us. <coughs> Mr. Armenti is the uh, district manager uh, who's assigned to Hopkinton, and uh, Kevin Welsh is our food service director. Uh, he's a Whitson's employee assigned uh, to Hopkinton as well. Guys? Well, thank you for having us uh, again this evening um, and giving us the opportunity to give you a mid-year report. Um, we understand the unique needs of the district. Um, as Ralph says, we've been here for four years and we're committed to customize our nutrition services to meet your needs. Um, I'd like to begin with some operational updates. Uh, at the beginning of the year, we've uh, provided training to the team members, which included safety in the workplace, allergen awareness, uh, offer versus serve procedures. Uh, we've brought our chef in, the executive chef, to enhance some presentation skills of the team. Um, also, uh, the uh, Mass Department of uh, Elementary and Secondary Education is required to conduct an administrative review of each district's nutrition program every three years to determine if they meet <laughs> state and federal requirements. Um, this year, Hopkins, um, Hoppington was due, and um, the review was in January. And after the review, we have an exit interview. Uh, and the uh, exit interview was very, very positive. Uh, the reviewer said we did an excellent job, the team. and. Um, we didn't have any deficient findings at all throughout the district. Um, regarding our marketing and promotion programs, we updated this year the posters in all the schools, all the nutrition posters. Uh, uh, we've uh, also updated the nutrition safari character signage in the schools, in the elementary schools. Um, each of our characters represents a different food group. Each offer their own unique message. Um, they also help promote uh, and communicate to the children our produce of the month and activity of the month promotions to encourage healthy eating habits and to become more active. Um, at the secondary schools, our quarterly spice promotion is Little Italy, and that's working nicely. Um, the kids are enjoying some Italian uh, favorites with a healthy twist. Um, also, we've updated the Smart Choice nutritional material that we provide uh, to the students. Uh, we again did the International Week at the high school, which was a success, incorporating different uh, menu ideas. And the biggest hit was uh, Sushi Day. Yeah. We had the chef come in, that's always a hit. Um, Regarding our ongoing nutrition education programs, we've got uh, character visits scheduled. Um, a character comes into the school in full costume along with the ranger to speak to children about nutrition. Uh, we have some guest chef visits scheduled as well. Um, we also have um, uh, new uh, lesson plans and educational material available as well. We continue to maintain the custom Hopkinton Nutrition Department webpage. Uh, features uh, monthly menus, general program information, nutritional activity sheets, um, educational links. Our menus include links to all the nutritional and allergen information that parents can click on directly for each menu item. This allows parents to review nutritional information every time uh, for every item we offer. A new menu app is available on the website for a breakdown of daily menu items uh, that we offer. Also some Whitson's uh, nutritional incentives. Providing, providing healthy food and ingredients to our customers is Whitson's first priority. Whitson's was the first food service contractor to eliminate high fructose corn syrup, trans fats, artificial flavors and colorings in MSG from all products that we cook from scratch. 
Whitson's is working towards being one of the first contractors that will offer organic and or non-GMO food products as an option in the near future. This is very difficult undertaking considering organic and non-GMO products are typically much higher in cost. Considering this cost and the demand from local communities, it's now up to the manufacturer to deliver mm -hmm. the product that is more cost effective for school food service. Having said that, Whitson's is working closely with the manufacturers to get the cost of organic and non-GMO free products down in order for us to provide uh, this to our customers. As we make strides on this, we will will incorporate these items within the purchasing structure for all of our schools. There is also a learning curve with staff as making organic and non-GMO meals from scratch requires culinary expertise on site and or additional labor. This is something we'll need to review during the budget process. We recently met uh, with a community group that we're inquiring about the possibility of an organic GMO free program. Uh, we were asked to research what some of the costs of offering organic options would be. It's very difficult to estimate the overall increase in costs switching fully organic program. Our purchasing department estimates about 40% more in costs. Many of the foods would need to be made from scratch because presently there are not a lot of convenience-based products that are organic to choose from. The additional labor cost to produce these items um, would also be, have to be added to the cost of the meal. Um, recently, uh, we, were, we, we did some research to look and see if there was any other programs in the country that were doing this. And there was a district in California that serves all organic um, meals and the price was six dollars and fifty cents and the premium meal was seven dollars uh, one other district um, and that was in california the other district was in miami and they had or they had a um organic meals brought in basically it was they would pre-order them and they would bring the meals in and those were at seven dollars a meal um so and both of those were in 12-month growing seasons, we were told as well. Yeah. Um, <coughs> however, some of the items that uh, Whitson's is presently working on to source uh, for the 2016-17 year uh, that would be organic or GMO-free um, would be spices, salad dressings, condiments, oils, and shortening and maybe bre uh, breakfast bars. In addition, right now, our granola and bulk uh, portion yogurt are already organic. Uh, that's a stony field product. Um, we were also asked by the group uh, about the cost of providing organic salad greens uh, for the, um, the high school and the salad bar and then in the elementary, a pre-made salad. Again, our purchasing department estimated um, a 40% increase in the organic lettuce um, uh, at this point. Um, we're also asked about the availability of grant money to supplement the cost of offering organic meals. We're unable to find any grant opportunities for promoting organic or GMO free food. Um, the farm to school uh, did provide grants. Um, some of the grants we saw that um, Amherst, Quincy, Somerville, uh, but those were all based on increasing consumption of local fruits and vegetables. There was nothing that was based on um, subsidizing organic or GMO free uh, foods. Um, but we would be happy to help um, with the district if anyone would like to um, write a grant at this point we, we the deadline was november for money for next year so you would be looking at writing a grant to the farm to school uh, for the beginning of next year for the following 18 year 
We were also asked about foods other than bread and milk that are locally sourced and high fructose corn syrup free. Those foods, or the foods we make in the cafeteria and the ingredients we use are high fructose corn syrup free. Um, locally, we do use local um, products. Uh, we use a vendor. Anything that we order goes to, is, is directly from this vendor is, uh, comes to local. Some of the local farms in the areas, Wards and Sharon, Linney Orchards and Lunenburg, Brickton Family Lookout is in South Natick. So um, the vendor we use will automatically ship us local produce um, when we order it. We're also asked about uh, what current meals we provide from scratch. Um, we were, uh, what we came up with was uh, pasta and meat sauce, um, really all the pastas. There's a pasta primavera, pasta alfredo, um, uh, chicken nachos. They've had uh, beef nachos and tacos, uh, macaroni and cheese. We've had uh, baked chicken. They've had turkey and gravy. Um, all the daily uh, salads, uh, mm -hmm. Caesar salad, garden salad. We also have harvest bars in all the schools, which include all um, uh, the, the weekly veggie subgroups that are required for the students to choose as much as they want. Um, we have the deli uh, boar's head cold cuts uh, at the high school. Uh, I think we had shepherd's pie uh, as well. So looking forward, uh, some of the things we'd like to do um, is looking at adding a new concept next month called Veggie Power, Power which would promote and feature the, uh, delicious vegetarian options, um, ongoing culinary training, conduct a survey to, with the students to assist us in proving services. I think that's already started. Yeah, um, the high school. The, going to uh, PTO meetings to present program enhancements and, and get ideas and feedback from parents. Um, also to uh, send out a parent communication to keep parents informed of the program. Uh, we're also gonna be involved in the wellness fair that's coming up. Uh, Whitson's uh, has a new product line under development called Tuscan Toast. Uh, these meals will uh, be combined with artisan breads with fresh roasted vegetables and sorted cheese and Hoppington would uh, maybe a, a test site for our chefs to come and try sampling with um, uh, students to see how uh, how they like it enjoy it and another station we're looking at adding at the high school would be a station called wraps to go where we would do individual wraps um, maybe three or four different kinds and, and the students can come up and choose two with the, and, and make a meal but have different uh, wraps. Um, the financial update, uh, the average daily participation year over year um, for the first quarter remains at uh, 35 percent. It was at 35 percent uh, also at the same time period last year. We uh, have a surplus through January. Um, however, we're gonna need to upgrade the point of sale. Uh, the software is outdated and no longer supported by the system <coughs> provider. Um, and most of the hardware won't uh, support the upgrade. So that's something that we're going to have to um, invest in and change and upgrade. Um, so. invest in, in our program um, and we're going to have to shuffle some money around in that investment and it may require um, an investment uh, on our behalf as well. For the software? F for the hardware. For the ha hardware. The software, you need to update the software because they don't support it any longer, the, the Horizon, the company. Uh -oh. But what happens is if you put new software, the hardware is so old it Got won't. It. Yeah. So, yeah, okay. the version of Horizon that we have um, has been basically 
outdated for a few years. They now have a, um, a web-based product. Um, I'm not sure what the uh, price increase would be, but we'll bring that uh, to you. Unfortunately, the hardware that we have uh, won't support, in every case, um, this new software update. So, okay, so we're, um, we're on budget and we're project, uh, projecting to meet our budget goals at the end of the year. And um, we also discussed the lunch equity uh, requirement for 216, 217 is um, year is 278. And currently the price is at the schools of the elementary is 250 and the secondary is 275. So for the last couple of years, um, for uh, I think it was probably three or four years ago, we talked about price equity. And for the newer members, um, what that's all about is the federal government now requires there to be a minimum price that we charge for a paid lunch on the average because they want to make sure that the amount of money that they give us uh, as a subsidy towards a free lunch does not exceed the selling price of our paid lunch because otherwise the free lunch money is subsidizing the paid lunch. Um, and so we're very likely going to have to increase our prices by a quarter um, so for I next year. I have a question along that line, if I may. So Joe, you mentioned a premium lunch. My understanding is, for example, that, that means a, a larger portion or an additional piece of pizza. Is that what premium means in um, our case? No, a, a premium a premium would be like the Boar's Head Deli. Um, um, I think there's a couple more expensive other. product. Yeah, yeah. Okay. more expensive. So it gives us the opportunity, like the sushi days. It yeah. gives us the opportunity to uh, provide a meal. Mm -hmm. So I, I hear your explanation, Ralph. But I've always wondered since the days of being a principal and seeing bins full of fresh food being thrown away, yeah. why we can't have a partial lunch. So, you know, we know that kids have to take the full lunch. There's, they can't say, I don't want the fruit. They can't say, I don't want the fruit cup. They have to take the full lunch, and then they don't want the fruit cup to begin with, so it goes in the garbage. I can answer that. <laughs> <laughs> just wondering. We just because, had the review. Yeah. I know Ralph can answer that. It could be a huge, I mean, I just yeah. don't like to see food wasted, especially when we're talking about price increases. Yeah. The people who pay a, a great portion of um, the price of uh, a meal that we serve is the federal government. Mm -hmm. It's the National School Lunch Program. And the National School Lunch Program um, d defines a reimbursable lunch yeah. as one that includes the uh, required components, right. which include protein and vegetables and grains. Grains, fruits, vegetables. There has to be dairy. so much involved in that. If a student doesn't take the components that make up a reimbursable lunch, mm -hmm. we get no reimbursement. Right, so that everybody's wasting money, right? I mean, so, I mean, yeah. I'm just saying, as of really basically, I'm feeling like, yeah, so that yeah. they have to spend the money in order to reimburse, reimburse the lunch, of which a portion of it is being yeah. thrown away, because in order for us to meet the requirements, yeah. we have to take the food. And I also know that we can't do anything with the food. So even if we were able to donate, you know, y you can't even you know, you just, yeah. So I just, I know that's the explanation. I wondered yeah. in your world if, if it's ever something that you grapple with, with government. Um, it's something that the um, School Lunch Association has brought to the government about um, yeah. the old Every days was, grapples with it. Yeah. You know, the old days it was, um, there was five components and if they took three, that was fine. Uh -huh. And when they changed the uh, the law recently, it went where they have to take a fruit or a vegetable. Right. And that's where... Yeah. And that's where we know that whether they take it or not doesn't mean they're going to eat it. Yeah. So yeah. Right. It's in our best interest and we do this. No, we know. encourage them to I, take... Of course. We require components. them, actually. We have a harvest bus. So we have different vegetables yeah. for them yeah. um, to try to uh, encourage them to eat. I and, know. Um, yeah, I just wondered orange. if there was a logical reason, but clearly. <laughs> yeah, we try to have a variety right. of different right. fruits right. and it's vegetables every it's day. So. Okay, thank yeah. you. It's all financially Thank driven. you. Yeah. Okay. Do we have the ability to compost? 
I mean, to your point, Kathy, if food is being wasted, is there an ability to separate that out and do some kind of composting? You could, but that would be that would be the district with maintenance and and okay. to, to coordinate so that, that would with be them. Cause, yeah, because I think sometimes districts with the um, animals and mm -hmm. you know right. really would have to. We'll work with you, however, yeah, we'll, but it wouldn't be something that uh, we, we wouldn't would have be to an work easy with your maintenance. Okay. Right. Right. I think the, the challenge there has always been also with the turnover. The, the lunch turnovers happen so quickly that we barely have time to clean the tables. I mean, we, we do clean the tables thoroughly, but there really isn't a lot of time for any additional. Um, we've also talked about the conversation about, especially as we were talking about the new building, you know, what about when you came, Kevin, having a like a dishwasher service and, right. and recyclable mm -hmm. plates and, and really when they cost it out, um, it, it's, you have to look at the, you know, breakage and maintenance and then having somebody hired to manage the dish room and all of these things, it, it is not a savings. Mm -hmm. The cost of chemicals, the cost of That's operating right. the machine. Yep. Um, there's, yeah, there's, there's more to it. Yeah. Well, that was sort of related to my next question, which is every every couple of years we get some enthusiastic students usually that, co that come in and give us a proposal about using um, more recyclable yeah. trays and, and um, silverware. And I don't know if that's, it's always been too complicated because of so separating it out. And I guess I'm just curious if there's any forward movement on that front. The paper tray, some districts go with a, with a, uh, a paper tray, but it's double the cost of what we're using. So that would be, if you're willing to, willing to absorb that cost, it's it's about double, and it's a, um, it almost looks like a cardboard tray. <laughs> and then just my final question, um, talking about you know organic and locally sourced foods I don't know if you have established a connection with water fresh farm right down the street or if that's something that you're able to do or would be cost effective for you to do but certainly the transportation would be minimal <laughs> yeah we talked to um, our purchasing folks about that and, and looking at a local day and um, seeing if they can't uh, make that connection um, with us uh, with them, so that that is definitely a possibility, because they were they um, come to the wellness fair, and that's right. we've we've discussed that with them a couple of times at the wellness fair. So that's that could possibly be a, an opportunity. Excellent, thank you. Sure. Um, so I have a couple of questions, but one thing I do just want to note from your first of all, thank you for the thorough nature of your presentation and. Um, it's funny you said this is their fourth year because this is my fourth year on the the committee and I remember the the hiring vote I, I just want to thank you for your partnership with the district in particular when you talk about engaging in the with the community and and striving to meet the needs and requests of the community um, I appreciate you updating us I heard personally some really positive feedback of the meeting that occurred um, with the group of people in town who were very interested in hearing more about um, the nutrition within the school lunch program opportunities for organic and non-gmo items um it's certainly something that interests me i understand the the push pull of the the how it's challenging to deliver right now but it's really i find it positive that you that you're actively looking into it and even looking into options for the upcoming year mm -hmm. um so it, it makes uh, as those who have to to authorize this contract every year it's it's not just about providing you know it's not just about a service provider who's going to bring lunches in lunches and breakfast in for our students but we really are looking for that partnership so um, you continue to really um, show that partnership so we appreciate it I just wanted to highlight that um, my questions so the point of sale I'm gonna go over here first so the point of sale system Ralph I'm assuming we don't have in the budget for next year right now no uh, but as I said uh, there is some investment money right which has been promised to us by Whitson's, which we've not tapped into. And that's part of the contract. And so uh, we can reshuffle the plans uh, to help procure this. Okay, so, okay, that makes sense. Um, and then from the standpoint of the urgency of it, I know you say it's not supported 
but from a software perspective, that means different things. <laughs> so do we absolutely need to replace it for next year? Or is it, if it crashes, we have no backup, basically, which may be one in the same, but it can, there can be a different, like, does the software not gonna work anymore? Or are we just looking at, they've they, moved on to a new version that they're not actively supporting anymore? They've moved up to two, they've moved up to two, two versions ahead of us. And okay. they don't support, as of this year, they don't support the version we have. So if we would have issues crash, mm -hmm. they can't help us. Yeah. Okay, that's that, okay. That's, I know that when you talk about scary. software becoming obsolete, that yeah. can mean a bunch of different things. So yeah. um, that's helpful. Um, and then with respect to the 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 price increase, so I know we did have uh, whether it was last year or a couple years ago, we did a price increase to that wasn't related to the federal price equity, it was related to just normalizing it for some of the revenue challenges we were having and getting it more in line with, yeah, it was yeah. a couple years ago, I think. Um, I guess the, the question I'd have is, I think you said that it was 278 was the, the number, so that's the average price purchase lunch? No, 278 is what the federal government pays as a subsidy. Right, so our, aver right. our average purchase has to be over $2.78 in order to qualify for that federal price equity. So I guess my question slash challenge, I'd like to see a little bit more analysis on that to not necessarily just go up 25 cents because it feels like if I look at these numbers, I don't know what the what the number of purchases are between elementary, secondary, and premium, but I could, there's math, pretty easy math that supports that we might not be that far away. And so I don't wanna just lob on 25 mm -hmm. cents every year. I'd like to make sure that we're, we're making, you know, we're, we're not, when price equity first came along, uh, the Department of Ed um, said at that point that um, districts would, rather than throwing a, you know, a quarter every five years, would probably have to make more regular increases. Mm -hmm. Historically, it's been, in, not just in this community, it increased it by 25 cents. It, it'd stay the same for three or four or five years. It increased it by another 25 cents. Yeah. So. What they, what they <laughs> probably prefer is that you go up a nickel or a dime every year. But to be honest with you, a nickel or a dime is a pain in the rear mm -hmm. end yep. for cashiers to deal with. So it's really easier and more efficient, and you get more bang for your buck uh, if you increase it by a round figure like a quarter. Um, that way you're not dealing with so much change. So on the flip side, aren't we having less, fewer cash transactions? probably uh, than we did if wow. you think about the yeah i don't know that off the yeah top of my because head. that's that's the i uh, what i saw when you see the numbers it makes sense right you want to yep. keep them round for yep. for quarters and not having some of those those but but as we move to more electronic it feels like we don't have to necessarily go in quarter increments so. Kevin could probably talk more about that i would well, bet you at the high school there's more cash to answer in your question in the word yes there, there's there's less cash transaction and more paying online now mm -hmm. with parents so that, that certainly helps. It helps speed up the process of the line going through, and it helps with the cashiers um, with less transactions. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I mean, I know that if we talk about a price increase, that's something that'll come back to us later. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, just we but as we Correct. head towards that, I'd like to just express that I'd like to see some sure. analysis that might support something more than just the twenty-five cents across the board. And I'm all set. Thank you. Thank you. So I appreciate you. You're looking for different options I just wonder what is the process for if you decided to offer an organic option I mean is this an all-or-nothing organic or non-organic type of mm -hmm. swap or would it be like a premium meal and an organic meal or do you have you ever thought have you thought that far ahead or are you still in the exploratory for how you would roll out something like that and would that be something we will get this year in a proposal what is the process around it I guess the pr the process is would our purchasing is looking at being able to get um, organic and GMO free products in in the price structure that we we currently have to basically bring it in and not have um, a financial impact. So that that's number one is to can can we get items in like salad dressings and things like that. Uh, spices and begin to move that. The cleaner ingredient, the better, the better for, for kids. So we know that, and that's what we're working towards. Um, to be able, I, I think the question that came was, could we go have a, um, 
a full organic program, uh, uh, GMO-free program. And I think, you know, looking at that, it would be like these other programs, $7, um, which would probably um, be an issue in the community to be able to uh, do that. And the other, the other part of that is it isn't even something that if you offered that meal, um, you have to understand, even if you offered that meal, you would in, in say children were going to pay for it pay for it and you had that you would also have to offer that to any free and reduced child that came through the line if they wanted it you would you would have you couldn't um, distinguish between them they would they would get the meal as well so you would incur that cost so there would be definitely there, there would definitely be a, an impact yeah um, I'm not saying that we're I just wondered what the process was for you to determine now that you've gotten this community feedback what the offerings are going to be. I think what, what it is is to, to, from our purchasing, to bring in what um, they can provide for us and present that to the community. Here's the dressings, here's spices, here's things, here's some of the scratch cooking um, that we can denote what those products are um, for parents. Um, uh, there may be where we can do a salad or something to that effect um, and offer that next year at a, at a premium rate. So really it's, it's an ongoing, okay. you know, and then we would have to see, is it something that, that's really gonna sell? Is it something that, you know, if the salad comes in, it's perishable. If, we, if it doesn't sell, what happens then? Now uh, your cost is gonna go up. So, um, okay. so your approach is to do what you can within the price yeah, with the structure that we have currently, right. not to go. Right. Unless you said, let's, if you said that's what we want to do as a community, we want to do this, then we would come back and say, okay, this is what it's going to cost. This is how it would work. And, you know, okay. you'd subsidize, you know, then obviously they would, the program would need probably to be subsidized at that point. So I just have one very easy question that my kids asked me to ask. What's up with the ketchup packets? And are you going to go back to the old packets <laughs> that taste good? So that's because there's, there's no my question. <laughs> that's the high fructose corn syrup, probably. That's Is it, it really? That's exactly oh, it. Oh, and the syrup, they'll say the same thing about the syrup yeah. because when you get syrup in the store, there's a couple things. If you get syrup <laughs> in the store, it's different because it's uh, without the syrup it's much lighter the ketchup is the same um, some of the cereals that we have are not cereals that you can get because um, you, when you when you see the cereals and you see like um, I think it's a cocoa puff you're thinking wow that's cocoa puff in the store but we have a low sugar we actually have it manufactured that's it's different than what you can buy in the store so again, manufacturers, once they get on board, once they realize there's products we need, they come around and begin to produce that. And that's what happened with the cereal. They, it's low, low uh, sugar cereals. It's different than what you can get in the... Um, I only hear about the ketchup. So the ketchup, the ketchup that, well, that's is not the issue. changing? We're, we're working on well, it. Well, you okay. can't have it both <laughs> we're ways. We're working on the ketchup. <laughs> we're working on it. I'm just going to go back and say we're working on the yes. ketchup. We're packing What them school ketchup. are they in? Um, Hopkins in the middle school. All right. Uh, Welcome, welcome to Don't our life. <laughs> special ketchups there, Kevin. I know. Oh. It's going to go by us oh. Thank That's you very so much. Good. Yeah, exactly. Black market. Um, my question was kind of similar to Kelly's in that how would we see this come as a proposal, but it sounds like there isn't going to be a proposal for a $7 lunch because that would be the program. It's not a premium lunch like what we offer at the high school for 325. We can't do that. So if we can't do that on a large scale, can we do that with products like, because it seems like it wouldn't increase labor costs, but milk or I don't know, the mini carrots or even if it's just the produce, right, or an apple, that a kid can buy a la carte that, so it might cost them more than the 75 cents or whatever the a la carte items are because they choose to buy an organic one that's possible i mean the other part of it is it's it's the availability of getting organic produce in this area some of these like like i said some of the the two um two schools we looked at were in 12 months one's in florida one's in california 
I mean, um, that is a possibility. I mean, that's something we we definitely look to move because the company Whitson's is looking to move in that direction. So um, we just need to see what makes what makes sense and what we could do. And the, I think you called it maybe like well, I thought of it as a subscription program where people had to sign up ahead of time mm -hmm. to get those lunches. So then you can sort of deal with the waste aspect, right? Mm -hmm. um, of like a perishable, if someone had to sign up ahead of time and say, I'm buying, my kid is subscribing to an organic lunch program for the month of September. Is that, I mean, is that something that we'd contract like an outside company to do? And I, I, I send my kid with lunch and I'm not, I, I don't actually think that this is necessarily the problem of Whitson's. But if this is something that people want, is there an add-on subscription program or a company that you know of that does something like that that we can work with? We, we could research that to find out if there is anyone in the area that would do that. We don't, we don't see that, uh, to be honest with you. We, I, we just, we don't see that. Um, so we can find out, we can do some more research to see. Um, and I would also have to find out exactly what you're asking is is to bring in a pro offer a product as a reimbursable lunch. A is it reimbursable? B, how does that fit again with the free and reduced kids where we're saying you can get it for seven dollars or we can get you this special one, but you're free, you're not allowed to ask for this. So I would have to see um, I would have to see the regulations really to look look through that to see um, what we would, if we're able to do something like that. I spoke to the business manager in Sausalito, California, which is the, um, the number, the first um, district in the country to go non-GMO and uh, organic. And she said the 650 to $7 price is bumped up to factor in the fact that they would have to provide that same meal to kids that are on free and reduced. So effectively you have the paying customers subsidizing the free. Mm -hmm. So you'd have to figure, uh, Fig figure that to, out. And, and that's, that's anyone's guess. That's something you'd have trial and error to figure out how many of them would, you know, what, what cost that would be to you. Are there any more questions? Thank you for your Thank presentation. You. Thank you very much. Kevin is a member of the wellness committee uh, as well in the community. And <coughs> he gets involved in a lot of things uh, behind the scenes, so yeah. kudos. Chris Heron brought that that's going to be a good presentation. Okay, I thank you. I recommend everybody that has an opportunity to see it to see it. Yeah, good stuff. You. Powerful. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Here we are, second quarter. Years going by fast. We're almost at the end of the third quarter, another uh, month or so. So um, I'm here to tell you that the picture is not as uh, quite as positive as it was at the end of the first quarter, um, mostly being driven by um, special education. At the end of the first quarter, we were projecting a positive balance of $391,000. We're now looking at $283,000. Um, and we, we now have five additional um, sped out placements uh, more than we did at the end of the first quarter. So we have seven um, additional sped out placements uh, that were then were budgeted. And the cost of those, as we pointed out at the end of the first quarter, was offset by the prepayment of uh, sped tuitions at the end of uh, last year. Um, Payroll uh, positive variance is $351,000. Uh, most of that is due to personnel attrition. Um, that number includes uh, the savings that we'll have from not filling the assistant superintendent's position until June 1st. Uh, column change is lower than budget. Uh, you know that you saw that number at the end of the first period, uh, first quarter. And then uh, negotiated pay increases. Um, we did not report that at the end of the first quarter because the contract had not yet been settled with the uh, HTA. Uh, so that was a positive variance because we settled uh, for um, less than we had uh, reserved. Positions added after the budget process and positions budgeted that's not filled 
are identical to what you saw at the end of the first quarter. The details follow. And then we have um, all other variances. Uh, that would be, for example, uh, some teachers who were, went out on uh, leaves, maternity leaves, and then they decided to stay out longer than uh, their period of disability. So we saved some money um, on them because the price of a long-term substitute is less than the daily rate for, um, for a teacher. So total payroll variance is 350000 Expense variance is a negative 130. You have the details there. Special Ed, again, is uh, leading the charge there. Uh, medical and therapeutic. Uh, a lot of that has to do with new students. A lot of that has to do with uh, students who may have been projected to be out of district who uh, we brought back, but they still required uh, some, some services. Professional development, uh, we have a, a small negative variance, 2,000 uh, bucks. Testing and assessment, um, there simply wasn't enough money uh, budgeted uh, in the special ed area for that. Grounds maintenance, uh, we're going to go a little bit over budget. Uh, building maintenance, uh, we've had a lot of issues that we're projecting uh, are going to cost us uh, $52,000 more than we had budgeted. Uh, but two lines, uh, two lines down from that, you see some savings in the extraordinary maintenance account. Uh, extraordinary maintenance was for specific items uh, that were uh, identified in the budget. Uh, they either came in at lower prices or we were able to do it ourselves. Uh, and then you have the copier maintenance. That uh, variance was there at the end of the first quarter as well. Uh, the next couple of pages show the breakdown by state function and then by programs. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions there. I would like to point out that in the area of um, the, the capital accounts, um, capital accounts, the first item on there is one that's created some conversation. It has to do with the money that was uh, kept aside from the new high school for the replication of agricultural lands. So uh, we, we did some uh, investigation. Gene uh, had some uh, historical knowledge there, passed along some old emails. I reached out to um, uh, Mr. Kamalo and asked him for some, um, uh, some guidance. And here's what he said. Here's the background. The school department did construct a building on land that was subject to <coughs> an APR. And the town was given the option of paying $110,000, which was $10,000 per acre, or putting an alternative 11-acre parcel under an APR. Legacy Farms agreed to do this for the town so that we could save $110,000. At this point, everything is in order for Legacy to restrict the land. Um, the developer is on notice that he needs to submit the required documents to MDAR, Massachusetts Department of Agricultural Resources, I believe. Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, the developer. Yep. And, yep. and so I said, so it seems that we're able to ask the town finance director to close out the new high school capital article at the end of the year, correct? And he said, yes, as long as the APR is the only remaining issue in the project punch list. And I believe that it is. There is no time frame for Legacy to specify uh, the deadline by which Legacy has to fulfill that obligation. Mm -hmm. But it looks as though we're going to be able to just s step away from that and no longer show that in our financial reports, which I think is a good thing. Except it's my understanding that there already has been a site walk at Legacy with the <coughs> Department of <coughs> Agricultural, whatever was the acronym, um, and the land that they were willing to set aside was deemed not acceptable. Well, so uh, unless they're now offering up new land. <coughs> well, um, so the developer has promised to review the documents and contact MDAR. The Legacy Farms HCA does not specify a deadline by which Legacy Farms should fulfill this obligation. Mm -hmm. So I think in response, Mr. Dumas, and in response to annual questions from the school committee about that, um, that amount of money, the 74570 we want to close the books on it in terms of any responsibility that we have 
and we've been <coughs> assured by the town manager um, that there isn't anything further that that we need to do it's rare that I'll say this but I think at this point this is really their decision and not ours this we don't own we this property so. and, and so if they want us to continue to hold the borrowing authority for it if they think they're going to need to pay the right. 110 so that they only have a smaller amount yeah. to come up with independently I feel like that's their decision that's what we we would agree we agree and the only yeah. reason that it's even showing up on our books is because at that time <coughs> the school was built the, the funds were expended under the direction of the school committee and so right uh, and and we came in under budget on the, on right. the building and so there was that opportunity just right. presented itself but I feel like at this point the decision about whether they find land at Legacy Farm still or they start having a conversation with the new Pratt right. uh, committee or they decide to come up with $110,000 is really a town decision. Yeah, it feels like, I agree with you, it's a town decision. It feels like I, I don't know, uh, regardless, it's $110,000, it's a, $110,000 if we had to come up with it. Uh, just speaking as a school committee member, but also as just a voter in town, I, I don't know that I'd support borrowing it. So I, I don't know why we have the, why we're leaving open the appropriation to borrow. It doesn't make sense. It, it, we, we'd have $110,000 probably somewhere in the, town operating budget that would cover the money we'd have to pay I it, it I would I really would like to see that based on that I think yeah. we should have that closed out yeah. by the end of this fiscal year I'm happy to, to get that off my report yeah. I really uh, am yeah that's I agree it's not our decision at this point and I don't like holding the borrowing for a hundred and ten thousand dollars right. is not the source that I think is responsible it's not, to, so not to, our obligation yeah. so and this yeah. implies that it is yeah. <laughs> yeah. I close it out you know, when, when I made the report, actually, uh, I, I meant to say something on, on, on the first page, that we're at 283. Well, that, that was a week ago when I put this report together. I'm happy to tell you that uh, we had some positive news on, on the special ed and uh, having to do with um, an out-of-district placement uh, that will save us some substantial money between <laughs> out of town um, and so that has not been factored into this because I became aware of it just recently that doesn't happen very often See, it's a rosier so picture right? it is a rosier all the picture. batteries and the light bulbs <laughs> <laughs> That's not, so, no, not yet they're not but I think we could probably afford some okay and I don't know if anybody has any questions I know I try to blow through this I'll go through it quickly assuming that you've seen it and would have developed any questions in advance so I thank you. Ralph, I don't have any questions. I, I just want to thank you, Ralph, not only for the report, but specifically for the time and effort you went into investigating um, that, that new high school piece that, that has been kind of baffling to me, and I know it comes up every year. So um, thanks for, for you know not only following up with it, but, but informing all of us on your results. Thank you. Are any of these unexpected outplacements um, affecting our budget for next year? Um, of course. Uh, so are we are we revising it, affecting it? Well, no. Um, okay. Some of them, it, it, it would depend upon the timing, Ellen, and I don't, I would have to double check that because um, I gave my first quarter report, I think at the beginning of November. And so um, after that, the FY17 budget was put together, and um, I believe that some of the kids went out after uh, I gave my report, but before the, the budget was voted on. But I'll double check those numbers, and uh, at the next meeting, I'll let you know. I think it's a great question, but it's a qu and it's a question that every community grapples with, and we just that you just never know. And I think we can only we can only plan our budget to the best of what we know that's in front of us and then leaving ourselves some wiggle room as long as under, as well as understanding that we have circuit breaker and the ability as we did last year to prepay and that's it just reinforces why that is so important to do whenever we can because there are unknowns and I, I don't know a superintendent who doesn't come to our meetings and with this very same concern about the difficulties around budgeting um, unknown special education yeah. needs. To assuage your concerns about next year, the student that I mentioned was over $100,000 uh, in tuition. 
So that was in the budget. Yeah. So, but this is, a, this is a really important point to remember when the Charter Review Committee does come and talk to us yes. about because a lot of this timing is driven in the Charter and there has been a request, as I shared with you before, to submit our budget two months early or month earlier. Month early. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, which based on this annual conversation is just yeah. going in the wrong direction. Yeah. So. Well, that's, I, th I think that that's, that's sort of my point, that it would be interesting to know how many at each stage we could be better prepared for if we could move our budget process. If we keep it where it is, if we moved it by a month, like at, what, is there a point in the year where we sort of, we have it figured out kind of for next year or no? It's a bit no? of a crapshoot. It, it really it's is. always so <laughs> fluid. Because <coughs> uh, one, of the, one of the laws in Massachusetts is the April 1st law. If a student moves here, <laughs> For April 1st we own that student's tuition for next year even though it's not in our budget if they move in after April 1st as long as it's a private tuition the sending town has to absorb that cost for okay. one year I didn't so, yeah it is I mean it is again worth noting for those who are who are paying attention to this and I think one of the things that you've done on this quarterly report that that shows that is that we are we prepaid $256,000 in SPED costs last year. So that was a, the budget items that we prepaid, and we are even accounting for that $7,000 in the hole right. on SPED costs, which means we're 270 some thousand over our budget number. But you didn't factor in the uh, contracted services in SPED, medical right. and therapeutic. Yeah, so that, and that doesn't even encompass all of it. Yeah. So, yeah, it's... Yeah. So I have one other question sort of on this vein. When I was at the tech um, legislative breakfast last week or the week before, I don't remember, um, there were several legislati legislators there talking about pending legislation related to the foundation budget review as well as um, circuit breaker in particular re regarding um, medical expenses. And so I cannot, sitting here right now, repeat to you exactly what the content of those bills are. But in the past, when there have been bills like that have been that have been particularly advantageous to us, the school committee has taken a position and sent a letter. Maybe we could have, I know that MASS has been really involved in drafting that legislation. Maybe we could have an agenda item at a future meeting just to get an update on that. And if we thought it was something that we wanted to send a letter of support you know, through our legislators, we might be inspired to do that. Because, I mean, to your point, Dr. McLeod, every district is dealing with these exact um, issues, and then particularly the suburban districts, the Chapter 70 formula is um, not, not drafted in our favor and under review, so um, we might want to weigh in on that. So we have a meeting with Karen Spilka next week. Great. Brad, so Holliston Superintendent, Ashland Superintendent, Medway, and myself. And so we are meeting with her for this very reason. Yeah. Yeah. And now that we have settled the HTA contract and given you this report, at the next meeting there will be budget transfer requests to reshuffle the deck. So you can expect to see those. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Let's I'll see you when I get in. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks Okay. Now we're moving on to new business. Um, appointment of the assistant superintendent. There is a motion before you. Um, there are two motions before you. So I seek a motion to accept the recommendation of the superintendent. And so we're just repeating our vote that we took in executive session? I'd seek a motion to accept the recommendation of the superintendent to appoint Dr. Carol Kavanaugh for the position of assistant superintendent subject to acceptable quarry background check and the successful completion of a mutually agreeable employment contract. So I, I will make the motion and just add that it, we had the opportunity to meet with Dr. Kavanaugh and think she's going to be a great asset to the district. Um, or I think so anyway, I think everybody does, um, in, in filling this position and really can move us forward. So I'm, I'm very excited to make this motion. Great. Second. Ms. Berkman? Yes. Mr. Graziano? Yes. Mr. Yes. And I'm yes, and Mr. Christian is absent. Unanimous. Okay. 
So it carries. The second motion is to authorize the superintendent to enter into negotiations and execute a contract with Dr. Carol Kavanaugh based upon parameters provided by the school committee. So moved. Second. Motion by Mr. Graziano, second by Ms. Knight. Ms. Birchman? Yes. Mr. Graziano? Yes. Ms. Knight? Yes. And I am a yes. Ms. Nickerson is absent. Next item <laughs> is um, Hopkins Center for the Arts. And for consideration is the review of the permitting request by the Hopkins Center for the Arts. Um, we had, I guess, a mini presentation by them during public comment, and we were able to ask questions. Um, we don't have a predetermined motion on the agenda. But we do have a request um, and a draft of a letter which we would s seek the um, approval of the school committee to submit. For the amendment, I have it up here and I can edit if you, if you sure. like. So can I Go ahead. Questions? So, um, So I should read the letter first. Um, so this is effectively a, wouldn't describe it as a support letter, but a, we don't find it detrimental to the educational activities um, and we've expressed some specific concerns. I think that's right. And the only other portion of this in the last paragraph is that um, there's a notice requirement in the MGL with respect to the number of days. And we did not receive adequate notice under that provision. And they asked us to waive okay. the time, the notice time. Okay. Which may invalidate sort of what my stance on this was if that's something that we need to do. I guess we don't need to do it, but we should do. Um, because I get I, the conversation with um, Ms. Grill and, and Mr. Joseph was was helpful, and I'm sure your conversation with them was was even more detailed than the one we had. Um, and it's clear that you feel like that the the, the parameters aren't detrimental to the educational activities of the school. Um, I guess I just wonder if I'm not sure we should be taking any action. Um, so, I, I mean, I think that's interesting. I think as a butters, that's why we've been asked. So we're not asked to take action on whether or not we think they're eligible for a permit. Right. We're asked, I think, as a, as an abutter, whether or not there's a concern that we have that should prevent them from seeking a permit from the Board of Selectmen. And that's their, in their purview to grant or not grant a permit. So, but I, I mean, to your point, I don't think they're required to get a letter from every single abutter. Right. It it's a bit of a, a negative request. consent option, right? It's if yes. we don't, and, and that's where I, I sort of feel as if we're not, it, while this letter is worded effectively in my mind to not be a letter of support for it, which is not in any way as a body our place to support or uh, to support it, but I also don't think as a member of the committee that would be something that. I'd even be in favor of, but um, I, that's where I, I just I come back to I, I'm 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 struggling. That this might be viewed as a letter of support, albeit tacit, and that's where I wonder <coughs> if, if we do not have any significant enough concerns to say to the board of selectmen, we believe this would be detrimental to the educational activities. I could be swayed from this, but my feeling is that we'd be better off not sending a letter than... Yeah. So I'll just read to you, um, if I may, the notice, um, which is what resulted in, in Ellen and I feeling that we needed to say something. And the notice basically indicates, um, based on the, the 500 feet, that, that there is a public school located within a radius of 500 feet. It, it states that if it objects to the issuance of the requested license, it must submit a written objection to the Board of Selectmen prior to the scheduled hearing on March 1st. Um, I do object, I mean, my feeling was that there were concerns, sufficient concerns around 
that abutting, I should say shared parking area that they addressed tonight in terms of that we would we would have the first say and we would be notified. Um, but I have concerns about insufficient lighting. I have concerns about kids walking across parking lots when there are events taking place with people exiting the premises. And so I don't know if that's an objection or not. So then I understand. I hear what you're well, saying. Well, so that shifts my opinion. Okay. And that is that, but it shifts my opinion also on, I think, the content of the current draft of the letter. Okay. Because what you're expressing to me here is a more, um, I think, is a more, is a stronger concern than I think comes across. Okay. Um, and that would be my concern because if we didn't, if we didn't have any, if, if not to minimize this, but if we didn't have any concerns about the educational activities, but felt like there were some things we could do to improve the lighting around the parking lot, they could that's do. somewhat they could what do. comes across in here. What you're saying to to uh, what I'm hearing you say is that we have real concerns about this as a as a concept because of students walking through the parking lot when events are going on in, in the insufficient lighting creating a real problem um so i, I what guess i struggled with um john was the this phrase um the the hca premises as defined are not detrimental to the educational activities of the school straight from that MC. it does oh, we were just, i was just reading it too i was like it's a pre-existing building. You're not going to change the premises. Well, it's and really that's, around the that's what I'm, what we're struggling with here yeah. because they're asking us to weigh in on if we have any objections to the issuance of the license. They're also t saying to us in, my, in the meeting that we had that it would be helpful. We don't have to include this phrase, but it would be helpful if we would be willing to in insofar as it's not detrimental to the educational activity so I'm looking at those a little bit separately because I, I don't see a direct causal relationship between the educational activities and the premises so yeah. well I don't want to necessarily although I'm not sure what choice we have in terms of make, making adjustments to the like, wordsmithing the letter oh we can meeting. I have it right up here but I, I also almost wonder if if it, it init the initial statement is that it's not detrimental to the educational and then and then that you shared your concerns regarding these and I, I would almost feel like we need to headline the concerns more than headline the that the premises are not defined I don't know if it's flipping the order of those paragraphs so the superintendent um, and if we're gonna sign it I would say the superintendent and the school committee um, have concerns regarding student safety etc 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 and then while you know while this is the case the school committee does find that the HCA premises that defined are not detrimental to the educational I, I or just if those concerns are all addressed yeah. because the lighting isn't in their proposal right you said right. they had to amend it yeah I, I just I feel like that's going to get across what you're expressing more strongly to the board of selectmen all right so should we maybe not take a formal vote but get a get a temperature on do we object or do we not object as a school committee to the permit no no one wants to I, I mean I think yeah our, our con do our concerns as articulated in this letter and maybe now the patio or any other concerns do they rise to the level for anybody here um, to be an objection or are they just concerns that we want to make the town aware of or do we feel like it's not our place I mean I think those are sort of the, the three options either we are we formally object we write a letter to share concerns um, just because we don't want them to go I guess unstated but it's not a formal objection or we don't write anything those are right those are the three options I like the concerns approach because it's the Board of Selectmen that's going to be issuing this and they're the ones that can put conditions on the <coughs> approval so they can formalize the concerns into conditions and we'd kind of be offering up conditions, if you will, in our letter, like suggested. They could be interpreted as suggested. Like I would like something in there around, we're gonna clear everything with the school district before we schedule any events. I don't want it to be like, we scheduled an event, oh well that's the night of the Chris Herring talk and we're using all of the parking spots Oh, sorry, we can't cancel 
it's an event, you know. I like that being in there as a concern that we get first dibs at all the parking and they work around us. Kelly, I think that's a great point because to her, she explained tonight, Kelly did that um, everything is planned a year in advance. They use our calendar a year in advance. Well, the Chris Heron presentation wasn't, wasn't on there. I mean, we've had plenty of notice. Um, but as I was listening to her and I was hearing some of your questions about events taking place simultaneously, I thought it would be helpful to us to even know that. It would be helpful to know which licensed activities are taking place on which <coughs> nights. But to your point of where is our jurisdiction versus, it's just it's tricky. Because some of these concerns, I mean, some of these concerns, quite frankly, if you talk about them in terms of sharing the parking lot and um, lighting, et cetera, they're not necessarily germane to the liquor license. Well, the I mean, I think the it adds to drink outside. I mean, the, no, no, I'm saying that the the concerns that are listed in here. I mean, I think they're they are amplified potentially by the consumption of alcohol, but. I mean, these are sort of more, cons you're, you know, the, the right of first refusal piece on the parking lot or the, you know, the clear, that's, that's a, whether or not they serve an alcohol, if they have an event the same night as the Chris Heron event, that's No, my safety concerns concern. were established, were, were specifically related to people okay. drinking and getting back into their cars. So I think we do need to make it that, I think it it's important to make that differentiation here. It was definitely related to here. the alcohol, yeah. yes. Because until this, this th there has already been an established agreement about the parking. Mm -hmm. And when tonight they said there could be an event with up to 300 people, well, that's going to take much more than that small little space that yeah. is in the agreement. The, I don't think the agreement I includes anything more than that, that the, the student, the senior parking. Is it parking. all of senior lot? That's it's it, all that's of senior lot. It is. So, but I mean, I think to the point that Kelly's raising, that seems more germane to the shared parking agreement as far as having to check with us before they schedule anything even you know even though they've got our year calendar mm -hmm. every time they want to schedule an event they need i mean i f i feel like that's not a liquor license conversation that's a shared parking lot mm -hmm. um you know facilities use essentially mm -hmm. conversation i don't disagree I with that i just don't gonna drive the use and it's going to drive the size true. of the events that they're hosting as is the new space that they've just moved right. into. Yeah, but it's also entirely likely that they'll have other events that will be large that won't have alcohol, like, for example, a play that would be relevant to what you're saying sure. um, yeah. as well. So, I mean, I get that it's sort of prompted by yeah. this new request, um, but it makes me think that possibly we need to also take another look at our shared use parking agreement with them and, and have a... Yeah. I think it's more enlightened conversation now than we had then just because it's we do need to open evolved. that that agreement because it has evolved and things have changed and we did talk about that too I think you know Ellen to your point we're being asked as a butters um, particularly given that it is a school if we have concerns about the liquor license but we're not being asked to make a decision right we're just being asked to weigh in to bring to light any concerns on the part of the schools that might not have been considered well and primarily the buyers. hours impacted by the liquor license are not per se school hours that doesn't mean there isn't a school event um, but it's not you know it's not opening a bar next to a school during a school day at least I mean in that case clearly we would need to take a very strong well position and then but it sort of gets to be yeah, to your point, Blurrier. that's exactly what I said to them when I first read this. Right. And it said that, the, you know, the all all alcohol beverages Monday through Thursday, 5 to 11, that's exactly how I expressed it. I said, it sounds like a, there's a bar opening right. up across the street. Mm -hmm. But when they agreed to redefine and, and really agreed that that was a very valid point, that's not what we intend, gave me examples like, you know, there could be an event during which intermission, during which a very small window of 30, 20 minutes they would open the bar and then it would be closed again. So within that three hour event of a window, the actual serving of alcohol may only happen for 20 minutes. Um, and I said, well, that, 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 is, that changes it. it. It sounds very different and, and it, could you define that? And they were, as you heard tonight, very willing to do that. Um, I think it could even be more specific um, because you asked the example of could there be something in the up upstairs right. space that's happening while there are classes downstairs maybe there's a limitation around that mm -hmm. um, and serving of alcohol during that time I don't know how specific the school committee 
wants to that's make their it. their educational program, so I don't know how. That's not our educational program. Well, it has a lot so of our kids at it, though. It's all yeah, the same kids. But they're, too. but you know, is like, it? Uh, that's their business. That's but their. I mean, right, and they're signed up on a weekend, you know. Or an do they also go to our school? Yes. Do they all go to our school? No. Mm -hmm. You know, that's where it's yeah. very, that, that seems too. like a parental decision. Because I know there's a ton of classes over there, and they're going to overlap at some point. The, the challenge, the challenge in, in what we talk about here, especially too, is is while um, this is not to say I don't in any way trust what we heard from them tonight and what you heard from them in the meeting is that now the, with with the changes that they're willing to make, we're now being asked to respond to a document that we, that we don't have. Yeah, right. And so, yeah, right. if they went ahead and made those changes are they actually going to be sufficient to allay our concerns? Mm -hmm. And we have no way of knowing that um, until we see said document. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. um, I wonder if that's if those concerns where we talk about the hours and the specificity, more, adding more specificity to the um, the actual serving provisions mm -hmm. would be worthwhile to put in the letter too. To the Ellen, to the question that you asked earlier, I would I would fall in line with Kelly on I'm not. I don't I don't I, I personally don't feel like it's a formal objection that we need to make. I do feel like we that that providing concerns, um, and that would hopefully move towards parameters of agreement that they'd be held to. Because um, the Board of Selectmen are going to have a meeting right. and this is going to be <clears throat> input. Yeah. Well, but so yeah. that meeting is also our joint budget meeting night, so we are going to be there. So oh. they're, they're going oh. to ask us okay. whether right. we have written this letter or not. So I, I mean, That's I think it's point. to our benefit to, <laughs> to um, you know, put things coherently down on a piece of paper that we can work from. I think I think so uh, our chair has a. I, say, I feel like we could revise for hours. So, to whom it may concern, start with the receiving of legal notice, the last paragraph, basically saying that we waive if we all agree to waive the nonconformity of notice. Mm -hmm. Then the superintendent and school committee have shared concerns regarding student safety and, in particular, insufficient lighting in the shared parking area, the volume and timing of events, the physical area where alcohol may be present, i.e. outside versus inside, the, <laughs> I think then we added the specificity. It's really the lack of specificity. The lack yeah. of specificity of the hours for permit. And the, lack of spe and the lack of specificity for the hours of permit with the directors of the HCA. Improving lighting in the parking area, limiting the location of alcohol consumption, and the timing of events requiring notice and or coordination with the school department for scheduling events. and adding specificity to the hours for permit would address these concerns <coughs> relative to a liquor license in an establishment abutting school property. I almost have the whole thing, <laughs> but uh, I am not going to be able to read there's that. There's a lot going on. Um, okay. So I got the first paragraph <laughs> picked up. You got the I'm, first paragraph? And I've got this. The superintendent and the school committee have concerns regarding. Have shared. <laughs> so we've shared our shared concerns. Their, their concerns. Shared, yep. th shared their concerns regarding student safety. Student safety, yep. And in particular. In particular. Insufficient lighting in the shared parking area on, on school, school property, property. Yeah. Comma. comma the volume and timing yeah. of events comma. comma the physical area where alcohol may be present open parentheses i.e. outside versus inside close parentheses comma Okay, i.e. outside versus inside, mm -hmm. close parentheses, comma, and the lack of specificity, the lack, 
lack, lack of specificity. Of the hours for permit. Yep, for permit. Mm -hmm. Period. No, with the directors of the <laughs> HCA. Well, it's already wait, in there, Can we right? back up? Not yeah. the hours for permit, the hours Sorry. of serving. Because the hours for permit are quite specific. Okay, the hours for serving. Yeah, so what they're saying is the hours for permit that are listed there don't actually match the hours for serving. Okay, okay. For Sorry. Yeah. For serving with the directors of the HCA. Mm-hmm. Improving the lighting in this area. I would just say improving the lighting, comma. <laughs> limiting, you know, so we can get rid of one phrase. Limiting the location of alcohol consumption. It's getting redundant. Should you say addressing these concerns? I think this is illegal. Oh, mm -hmm. all right. no, I'm not. I, I can't see it anymore. So let me the location of alcohol consumption, comma, the timing of events and requiring notice and or coordination with the school department before scheduling events. Requiring notice, sorry, and or? And or coordination mm -hmm. with the school department before scheduling events, comma, and adding specificity to the hours for and serving. And yep. I did. I had it down here. Hang on. Events. And adding specificity to hours. For serving. For serving. Mm -hmm. And now you have it. Would address, mm -hmm. I'd say these, get rid of safety, these concerns relative to a liquor license on whatever. The rest. Concerns. You have to say it again. Cause it's, I, oh, you deleted it? Sorry. Right. Concerns relative to a liquor license in an establishment, a budding school property, period. <coughs> okay. And then I would add that last sentence, which was originally your first. The school committee finds that the premises as defined are not detrimental to the educational activities. Okay. And then is it signed by you and I? Sure. Does anyone else want to look at it again? No. Oh, yeah, yeah, well, I mean, yeah, but she, I think she was just talking about, like, editing it. Is she getting rid of our signatures, right? Yep. And this is the right language. The premises, as defined, are not detrimental. It's not. That was the language they sent me. Okay. Because oh, yeah. I was expecting there to be something about the liquor license. In no, the it was exactly that, that, okay. that sentence. Yep. Okay. So, would anyone like to make a motion to authorize the school committee chair to sign the letter to the Board of Selectmen, yep, the school committee chair and the superintendent to sign the presently drafted letter to the Board of Selectmen. I don't so even know what I just said. So moved. Great. Second. Motion by Mr. Graziano, second by Ms. Knight. All those in favor? Yes. 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 I'll, send, I'll send it to you for one more look before. Yep, sure. <coughs> Just let me know if you want a title or mm -hmm. a square. No, no, no. I can do this. <laughs> okay. Good. Moving on to the student handbook. For our consideration, <coughs> this is the request and recommendation of the superintendent to approve the high school and middle school student handbooks that have been amended to be consistent with MGL Chapter 76, Section 1A and 1B. Um, there's a recommended motion before you. Are there any comments or questions on the motion? Okay, so I would seek a motion to approve the high school and middle school student handbooks that have been amended to be consistent with MGL Chapter 76, Sections 1A and 1B. So moved. Second. Motion by Ms. Knight, second by Mr. Graziano. All those in favor? Yes. 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 Unanimous and so carried. Next, we have school committee policy IHAMB and um, IHAMB-E1. Sex education policies for our first reading. For a request and recommendation is, I'm sorry, for consideration is the request and recommendation of the superintendent to amend this policy to reflect the current practice. Does anyone have any comments or questions on the recommendation or the recommended motion before you? 
you had mentioned we, I know you mentioned one of the emails was related to a book, but the other one I thought was related to the policy. So I think we, um, one was, yeah, one is not really policy related. It was asking for information, I think, because this was on our po on our calendar and yep. our agenda. Someone thought, oh, they Surprisingly deal generated with, two emails. They deal with sexual education. Can I have the title of the book? Yeah. Um, and the other specifically was asking for a modified, a modified curriculum for our special learners. And so um, Dr. McLeod was going to speak to that. But I don't, yeah. I don't know if it causes a revision in the policy but it, in any event it doesn't I, I could start with that to to uh, through your question and then i'll give you a little bit of background background <laughs> um, so the question is related to providing accommodation for special education students around the curriculum and that is something that we do across the curriculum in all areas the parent is specifically asking that there be sufficient notice as well uh to not only i guess she had requested that this um this modification take place and it, it took December several months before it happened and 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 it certainly wasn't time in terms of her being able to understand how the curriculum was going to be modified to meet the needs of her of her daughter um, and so what I had replied to to Ellen was that this is absolutely something that we need to take on but not through policy it wouldn't be something that we would tie to policy because it's a curriculum modification um, but it is something that I will take up um, with the special education department around this particular, I know this is an area of great concern, um, sex education. Um, and I know that this is something that has come up as well with, with CPAC. So um, I will definitely follow up on this. And um, I actually have a meeting tomorrow morning with the SPED chairs. So, okay. Thank okay. you. Um, the other piece I wanted to, what this ended up coming, the reason it came up as a policy amendment was that it wasn't consistent with, the policy as written was not consistent with our practices, specifically around notification. Um, the way we have been providing notification varies by building. In some cases it's in the handbook. I think at the high school it's in the handbook and parents sign off on that. Um, at the elementary school, the notification takes place just before the that particular unit and the principals feel that that is a much better way of notifying parents rather than having it randomly in a handbook that you are expected to read at the beginning of the year and how can you possibly remember that oh yes this is going to take place in April so I just wanted the policy to be consistent with the practices and that that's the main change um, the other thing that I am suggesting that we delete is um, this this piece about um, Dissatisfaction. It, it, it's it's the dissatisfaction after the process, and that they can take it to the superintendent. Um, parents can do that with anything. I, I don't know why it's called out in this policy mm -hmm. more than any other. Um, so I just didn't feel that that particular paragraph was relevant. We in fact have a policy on that process. Okay. Well, that's what I was going to say. It's we the could school concerns. That. Yeah. We yes. could cross-reference that, but we, we could. But we could also cross-reference that in everybody. Right. Yeah. yeah so. My only question is just because I think the policy went out today or yesterday. Yesterday. And I didn't see the emails, but it sounded like there were several. I don't know if there's time sensitivity and it's worth waiting till the next meeting just to see if we are getting more emails. I, I mean, I the only thing that <coughs> I think the change is really just The only thing we changed was notification. Right. Um, I don't object to doing it tonight. I and I do apologize know. that it didn't go out sooner. That was certainly an oversight from my office. Um, I think that when we don't do policy every single time, it ends up, because it's new practice, it ends up not n not remembering to do it. So thank you for letting me know that it hadn't gone out. Um, if it were something more substantial, uh, but I just feel that given that it really is just to be consistent with notification, I, it's up to you, obviously. I, I think, I, so I, I, I think in this case, I'm, I would be comfortable approving it despite that because even the feedback that we've gotten as we noted wasn't actually specifically related to the policy so we may continue to get emails on the topic because it may have just brought the topic to front of mind for some parents yeah. but um, I, if we waited a week it doesn't seem like it's that urgent but it does yeah. also seem like the changes are pretty innocuous so I, I wouldn't mind knocking it out tonight I mean we need to have some more business at some of these meetings. <laughs> the only I mean We're the so only, I don't think that 
any of the changes are problematic and I'm completely comfortable with all of them. The only, my only hesitation is that given that we have said that the policy is open, somebody may have a different substantive change that we have not considered that they might want to ask about and two days is just a short turnaround to do that. Sure. But if, so if there's not time sensitivity, we could, um, we could just- There is it. not. That's a good point. I'd, yeah, I'd be comfortable rolling it over. Okay, so we'll bring it back for a second reading on March 10th. And we have old business for March 10th. And then we'll have old business. It's because we're so efficient. That's just for you. Um, next is the lease agreement with the Boston Athletic Association and the 2622 Foundation. For consideration is the request and recommendation of the superintendent to accept the renewed lease agreement between the Hopkins Public Schools and the Boston Athletic Association and the 2622 Foundation. There is a recommended motion before you. Any comments or questions on the motion? I had some questions about the revisions. Okay. Um, not really anything substantive, but there were some areas where I thought we could put a little bit more specificity that might just be helpful because this is such a long-term agreement. Um, so, although I actually had a question in, in A, um, in the fourth paragraph, it's saying, um, the fee component related to custodial services and the facilities related cost or services will be paid through funds received by the town consistent with past practices. Is that, is that a reference to marathon fund money that comes, so that seems separate from our agreement, right? Like we, that's money that goes to the town that gets used for separate purposes. What we're dealing with here is essentially the $35,000 so you're looking at the draft and there have been a couple of where are you looking exactly I'm looking in the fourth paragraph under a about the cause uh, the fees yes that comes from somewhere else that's above and beyond <coughs> the 35,000 is that I'm sorry the school committee yeah. also agrees that the fee component is that where you are yep. yeah so they want that in this agreement and they're asking actually for I think this is what the addendum relates to okay um, and so, so a couple things. One, and maybe maybe this wasn't your understanding, and maybe I had it wrong, but I, I did check with the minute taker. Um, that I I think this we did go through it and we signed it. Um, I signed it on behalf of the school committee because I believe that at our meeting we authorized yes. me to negotiate and sign it. Um, but in any event, there is an addendum that the BAA and the 26.2 found, actually the BAA, not Tim Kelda for the 26.2 Foundation, is looking to deal with that addresses these, I think it's the fees and the custodial service and how the money goes through to the town because they feel like it's not clear. And they, um, although it's separate from the 25,000 that does come to us, their feeling is we're, they say they deal with it in every single town that they, I guess, give right. money to they that do they route. Yep. run through. Um, but they really want clarity on it, and there was no way it was coming out of here, and they actually want an additional agreement around it. Okay, so this part isn't really about our particular agreement, but it's in there f because it's important to because them. Because it's, very, it's right. very important to them. That's and it's, right. there's going to be additional detail that they're proposing to Dr. McLeod that okay. we haven't agreed to. So if you... If you've already signed this, then I know. Well, I'm. I so no, but I'd like to know your changes. If it's moved. small, if it's if it's edits that are I think are significant, then we can consider mm -hmm. going back to them and just saying, hey, we're making these. We're going know. back anyway because of the amendment. It's an addendum. Oh, addendum. So okay. we don't. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. But we are going okay. back anyway. And I realized too. I skipped over um, in this first section called recitals. It makes reference to our community use, uh, our our facility use policy. And it lists several amendments or revisions to that policy. It doesn't list all of them. So I don't really know, A, why any are necessarily listed, because whatever is the particular date, there's going to be one that is in force that is on our website. So I don't really. Okay. But if we're going to list them, then we should list all of them. So your point is So my that point it is be either 2001, 3, and 5 come out or you add in 9, okay. 12, and whatever other ones okay. there were. Yep. Um, then, so the date of the agreement isn't filled in, but I assume since you've signed it, there's a date now under C. Now I'm skipping ahead. 
Yep. Yes, it's it's filled in as February 22nd. Okay. Um, and then, um, so my question on section D, Availability is subject to availability of such facilities as determined by the school committee. So that's that paragraph's been revised. I don't know why. So I don't. That's what I. That when I asked if it was in the packet, I meant the, this one. I didn't think it was because we get we did it so late. But anyway. Shall I read it? Yep. The school committee agrees to make certain school athletic facilities available to the BAA upon request at no additional charge for its youth and American athlete development programs periodically during this agreement. This includes, at a minimum, access to the facilities agreed upon by the superintendent or designee at least five days prior to the date of the event in any given year. The BAA shall make such requests at least 60 days in advance. Such availability shall not be unreasonably withheld. So that was the, for this year, the understanding is, as I explained it to you, um, we wanted the, the five days gave them more flexibility, but um, as, as Ellen had described, we wanted to make it, we didn't want to make it so specific that it could tie the hands of a future superintendent or, mm -hmm. or, or changes that might happen. But we also took out the school committee because no one well, appears that was, to come to us. Exactly. For so that so. was my <laughs> first question. Although hearing now, and, and when you referred to it earlier um, about the five days, the only thing that, that jumps out at me is that if they are now setting up on Friday during the day and Thursday night or Wednesday and Thursday, whatever it was, um, all those students are not going out for gym class or practice. They're traveling back and forth across that property There's from the school. Police schools. detail. Okay, so quarries Sorry. aren't an issue. That was no. where I was going with that. Correct. Okay. They have to require police detail <clears throat> okay. as they did last year. That's excellent. And so then my only other um, suggestion is because, you know, the, the individuals involved and in, in, historically involved in this may be changing in the future if we could add um, somewhere in here the approximate date by which the fees would be paid I think that would be helpful just for any future finance directors to have it on their radar screen to be expecting it or any future BAA people to know oh you know it's due in it would be helpful we talked about this actually and I asked Ralph as a follow-up when we typically get it um, and, I, and I think it would be, you know, given just different people move on and change, and we want to make sure that someone's expecting the money. Right. Because <laughs> so. it's a lot of money. We do good things yeah. with it. So those were my only requests. Um, well, I was listening to you on whether or not that could go in the addendum, but I think the addendum is to spe specifically deal with okay. the other types of fees that apparently the BAA pays, like every town. Where, so would, you, where would you think to put that, Jean? So I think, well... Payments and notices, I think it goes in H, and we would just say payments should be made by the BA, BA on, you know, before shall be made payable to, shall be made by, made by, yeah, no by later than X on or before. Right, that's good. Um, whatever date, we'll have to check with, I don't, I don't know when they normally make it, but on or before X date well, and, and should be made payable to. End of the first but week of June or something? I think we didn't get something? it this year, right, because this is the year where we didn't. We did. Did we get it? We got. We came back and, and it was more than we expected. I just, okay, the way I know that we get paid is usually Tim comes with a big check, which I don't remember him, like a big fake one. No, it was combined. Okay, mm -hmm. and so. Um, because the the payments for the bleachers had already been met, so yes, we got right. a combined 35000 That's right. And I can't remember if I'm usually wearing my coat during that meeting. Are, or yeah. If it's, <laughs> yeah. If it's a warmer weather meeting. Anyway, so that's why I just thought if we could put the date in there, that'd be helpful. That's a great idea. And so I'll follow up with Ralph on suggested there. Okay, and then we'll just reach out to them and say yes, we, we made these mm -hmm. minor edits. Do you yeah. want to still have the motion Thanks. now, or do you want to roll it over until the edits are done? Um, we can roll it over until the edits are done. Well, maybe it would be helpful for us to see the addendum. And then we'll just do it all at one time. Okay. Yeah, I don't. I don't plan on negotiating the addendum. I mean, because it's not even something that we've done before. So I think the addendum will come through long before. I mean, after this one gets signed. If that are, makes sense. Are we not weighing in on the addendum? Or? No, I think okay. we are. I'm just saying it's not. It's not. You don't want to wait for it. What? You don't I don't want to wait for it, it to okay, get this. Fine. Fine. I don't think you'll have to. That's fine. I think we can get both in for the next meeting. Okay. It's just a Tim's ready. He just has been out straight. So. 
I'll okay. just chase them a little bit. Great. Sorry, I sent I you first. that edited version, I I so okay. I'm just trying to find my. Once you have a chance, I will. Okay. Okay. Um, okay next, the capital project article warrant number sixteen dash zero four three in the amount of five hundred twenty nine dollars and sixty six cents for consideration is the request and recommendation of the superintendent for payment of invoice for capital project as appropriate in Article twenty four. There's a motion before you. Are there any comments or questions on the motion? I seek a motion to approve the payment of warrant number 16-043 in the amount of $529.66 to the vendor as outlined in the warrant. So moved. Second. Motion by Ms. Birchman, second by Mr. Graziano. All those in favor? Yes. Yes. Unanimous. Okay. We have no old business. We have an opportunity for public comment. <laughs> um, so we'll move on to items by consensus. Dr. McLeod. The superintendent recommends a school committee vote to approve the operating budget and other funds warrant number 16-0 in the amount of $388,844.80. The superintendent recommends a school committee vote to approve the high school student activities warrant number 16-042 in the amount of $21,780.35. The superintendent recommends the school committee vote to approve $121 from the HPTA Spirit Wear and $697.90 from General Mills Box Tops for Education fundraisers be placed in the center school gift account as indicated in the agenda materials. The superintendent recommends the school committee vote to approve $2,082.81 from General Mills Box Tops for Education and $112 from the HPTA Spirit Wear fundraisers to be placed in the Elmwood School Gift Account as indicated in the agenda materials. The superintendent recommends the school committee vote to accept a gift in the amount of $500 from the Hopkinton Running Club to be placed in the Elmwood School Gift Account for the Marathon Fitness Program as indicated in the agenda materials. The superintendent recommends the school committee vote to approve $2,122.40 from Target's Take Charge of Education fundraiser to be placed in the high school gift account as indicated in the agenda materials. The superintendent recommends the school committee vote to accept a gift in the amount of $2,500 from EMC to be placed in the high school gift account for high school robotics as indicated in the agenda materials. So moved. Second. Motion by Ms. Birchman, second by Mr. Graziano. All those in favor? Yes. Yes, yes unanimous, and so carries. Our next meeting is Thursday, March 10th at 7 p.m. here in the Middle School Library. I'm sorry, our next meeting is the joint meeting with the Board of Selectmen on March 1st at Town Hall. And then after that, our next school committee meeting um, it, that's here in the Middle School Library will be March 10th. Mar what? I thought that was just with department heads. Um, for right now, we're March we're March first and March tenth. <laughs> now I'd seek a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Motion by Ms. Birchman. Second by Mr. Graziano. All those in favor? Yes. 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 Unanimous and so carries. We're adjourned at eight thirty. Nine thirty. <laughs> <laughs> but right on the